Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Woodrow Wilson Center. I'm Bob Hathaway. I have the honor of directing the Asia program here at the Wilson Center. Um, as perhaps many of you or most of you in this room know, but maybe not everybody who's watching this remotely, uh, the Wilson Center is the nation's official memorial to our 28th president. Um, the center was created by the Congress uh, to commemorate both the scholarly depth and the public policy concerns of President Wilson. Uh, and we seek to serve as a bridge between the two very different worlds of the scholar and the policymakers. Um, a divide, I might add, that Nancy Bernkoff Tucker uh, bridged far better than most of us. Uh, we at the Wilson Center are greatly privileged uh, to honor Nancy uh, through this Nancy Bernkoff Tucker Memorial Lecture Series on U.S. East Asia relations. Uh, many of you, indeed probably most of you in this room, uh, knew Nancy as a scholar, uh, a teacher, a mentor, a friend. Uh, we knew her in all these capacities, uh, but we also knew her as a member of the Wilson family. Uh, Nancy was a visiting scholar here at the center for a year in the 1990s, uh, and then during the last four years of her life, uh, she was a non-residential senior scholar here. Uh, she was a frequent speaker at our public events, um, even more frequently. Uh, and almost always with Warren uh, tagging along. Uh, she attended our events and invariably uh, contributed informed and insightful uh, remarks. Uh, she also served as a valued advisor uh, and counselor to the Center's Cold War International History Project run by my colleague Christian Osterman. Uh, so yes, uh, Nancy was family, and we're immensely proud uh, of those ties. Uh, and Warren, Warren Cohen, we're gratified to you, uh, her husband, uh, a distinguished scholar uh, of East Asia in your own right, uh, and I might add, uh, my predecessor is director of the Asia program. Uh, we are gratified that you've given us this opportunity uh, to host this annual lecture uh, in memory of Nancy. Um, you will have seen Nancy's biography in the program you collected as you entered this room. Uh, you will recognize that the printed biography doesn't even begin to convey the full essence uh, of this remarkable woman. Uh, the keenness of her intellect, uh, the shrewdness of her judgments, not only about history but also about uh, policy making in this town. Uh, it doesn't accurately convey the depth of her scholarship, uh, her delight in her colleagues, uh, the gusto with which she embraced life, uh, or the magnificent courage um, with which she confronted death in those last years. Uh, the printed bio notes her astonishing scholarly output, uh, but it doesn't adequately convey uh, the high esteem uh, with which her fellow scholars regarded her. Uh, Nancy cared deeply about China, about Taiwan, about Hong Kong, uh, and about U.S. policy in East Asia. Um, and she believed that history had and has something to say to contemporary policymakers. Uh, indeed, on two separate occasions, um, she enlisted in government service to use her remarkable skills as a historian uh, to contribute to the fashioning of better policy. So we honor Nancy today uh, as a scholar of U.S. relations uh, with East Asia. Uh, we honor her as a splendid teacher, uh, a generous and genuine colleague, uh, a talented public official, 
and most of all, a valued friend. And who better to help us celebrate Nancy's life uh, than Harry Harding, uh, who knew Nancy well and who himself has made such a signal contribution to our understanding of China uh, and of Asia. Many of us remember Harry uh, from his long service as dean of the Elliott School here at George Washington University. Uh, under Harry's leadership, the Elliott School uh, became one of the most respected international affairs schools uh, in the country. Uh, to the great sorrow of many of us in Washington, uh, Harry is more recently decamped to Charlottesville, uh, where he serves as dean of the Frank Batten School of Leadership and Public Policy uh, at the University of Virginia, while simultaneously holding appointments as professor of public policy and politics and in the School of Architecture. Um, that combination, combination of positions tells you all you need to know about Harry. He's everyone's go-to guy. And of course, he was our go-to guy uh, here today. Uh, but he's first and foremost a scholar of China, uh, of US relations with China and of East Asia. Um, Harry also, and you may detect a pattern here, uh, Harry also ran the Asia program at Wilson Center uh, at an earlier stage uh, in his career. So you can see that I've got awfully big shoes to fill. Uh, Harry's uh, more extensive bio is also in the printed uh, program that you received. Um, and because I'm perfectly well aware of the fact that you came here not to hear Harry, but to hear me, uh, I'm going to simply <laughs> invite uh, you to uh, read the full listing, or not even the full listing, but a larger listing of his accomplishments and his books uh, in that program. Uh, and I'm going to get out of his way uh, and let him come to the podium. Um, Harry, we think it's fitting that it is you who is delivering the Nancy Bernkoff Tucker Memorial Lecture on U.S.-East Asia Relations. I'm delighted to welcome you back to the center, uh, and I uh, look forward to hearing your remarks. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Bob, very much, and uh, thank you all for coming. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's good to see you all here. It's both a great pleasure and a high honor for me to be here with you this afternoon. It's a great pleasure for me to be back at the Wilson Center, an organization in which I spent about a year and a half way back in 1979-80, helping to organize and launch what is now the Center's Asia program that Bob Hathaway heads, and as was mentioned, Warren and Nancy before that. And also, that opportunity, that time I spent here, was my first real experience in organizational leadership. And if it had not been for that opportunity, all of the other things that I've done in terms of running schools, of international affairs, and public policy simply would not have happened. And it's a great pleasure, too, to take this opportunity to begin to do more speaking and writing about China and U.S.-China relations. I've spent the last 15 years uh, doing, or 15 of the last 18 to be more precise, uh, being a full-time administrator, being a dean of uh, two schools, um, and uh, most recently a, a school of leadership and public policy in a very, very different area than I had worked on before. Now that I'll be stepping down from that position sometime later this year, I'll have the chance to get back to teaching and speaking and researching and writing on what, to some degree, I still know best, and that is China and the American relationship with China and the rest of Asia. So that's why it's such a pleasure to be here. And it's also an especially great honor to give this lecture in memory of a good friend and an outstanding scholar the late Nancy Bernkoff Tucker, who left us far too early, but whose contributions to her country and to the study of its relations with China will not be forgotten. And so I want to give special thanks to Bob Hathaway and to Warren Cohen for giving me this opportunity from which I derive great pleasure and which I feel is such a great honor. Now, in preparing for this talk tonight, I revisited parts only parts 
of Nancy's impressive body of writing on the U.S.-China relationship and U.S. policy towards China from the late 1940s until her untimely death in 2012. I did not look at a second corpus of writing, which is basically oral history. Uh, so I looked only at her more scholarly, analytic writing. I'd read most of her books and articles in that uh, genre uh, individually before, but I confess that I hadn't looked at them together as a single corpus of work until I began to prepare for this lecture. And when I did so, I saw what I considered to be a clear thread running through that body of work, a sustained interest in what I'm calling a series of tough calls in U.S. relations with China. The difficult analytic assessments faced by American observers over the years and the difficult policy choices made by American decision makers at various points in the history uh, of the relationship. Now, by tough analytic calls, those are the decisions uh, where the question is, what's happening? Where are things going? And what will it mean for us? And then the second category are the tough policy calls. What should we do about those developments? How can we advance American objectives? How can we um, design our policy so it has the best chance of success? Now, these two different kinds of assessments are tough calls for a very similar reason. They both involve predictions, predictions about how a situation is evolving, how uh, it will continue to evolve, how that situation's evolution will affect our interests, and predictions about the outcomes of the different policy options we're considering. As the late philosopher Yogi Berra famously put it, predictions are hard, especially when they're about the future. They're difficult because of the complexities and uncertainties that they almost always entail. Analytic calls in foreign affairs are particularly hard because they require assessments of the likely course of both the domestic and foreign policy evolution in other countries, and then the probable evolution of the relationships among countries, each of which is making its own policy choices. And policy calls are even harder than analytic assessments because they involve two linked sets of predictions. How the situation is likely to evolve, that's like uh, the uh, analytic calls, but then what the likely consequences of our responses will be. In addition to that, of course, policy calls often, policy calls often involve tough ethical choices, the weighing of competing priorities, and the allocation of scarce resources among them. Former Virginia Senator Jim Webb, speaking at the Batten School just the other day, before receiving this year's Jefferson Foundation Medal in Citizen Leadership, said that one of the most important characteristics of leadership is the ability to make a continuing series of difficult decisions, decisions that are, involve perceptive choices, ethical choices, uh, and the need for decisiveness. So in other words, leadership involves the ability to make what I'm calling tough calls. So what were some of the tough calls that Nancy studied over the course of her distinguished career? I'll give you an illustrative sampling of them um, without uh, at all, again, being comprehensive. The whole talk on tough calls is only one part of Nancy's work, and I'm just going to be sampling within that genre of her work. Her earliest work on letting the dust settle in China after the success of the Chinese Communist Party in the Revolutionary Civil War on the mainland examined one of the first, most difficult, and most controversial of America's tough policy calls with regard to China. Nancy's book by that title opens with an important insight, that policymakers often prefer not to have to make tough calls because the situation is so unclear and the choices are so controversial and so difficult. Now, the issue that uh, Secretary of State Dean Acheson and Harry Truman faced in 1949 was, as Nancy summarized it, whether to continue to support the nationalist government of Chiang Kai-shek even as it retreated, tottering and corrupt, from the mainland to Taiwan, or whether the United States should try to deal with, and I'm quoting Nancy here, the avowedly communist regime 
that had been established in Beijing, even at a time when the United States was increasingly committed to the containment of communism in Europe. Either option would carry significant costs and uncertain benefits. So Truman and Acheson's initial call was actually not to make one. Their decision was not to decide once and for all, but rather to let the dust settle. And again, quoting Nancy's summary of their uh, thinking and their decision, preserve American flexibility. In the meantime, while trying to persuade the new communist government in China to do the same and not to align itself too quickly or too closely with the Soviet Union. But while one tough call, what to do about China, could be postponed, at least they thought, another tough call could not be delayed. In Nancy's words, and again I quote her, the approaching nationalist debacle plunged the secretary, Dean Acheson, and his staff into the unwelcome but ultimately unavoidable task of analyzing national objectives in the Far East, end of quotation. The policy call that emerged from that imperative was embodied in the well-known National Press Club speech of January 1950, in which Acheson appeared to place both South Korea and Taiwan outside the so-called American defense perimeter in Asia. Whatever the merits of the first call, the decision to let the dust settle before deciding what to do about China, the second call appeared to encourage, or at least did not deter, North Korea from attacking the South in June 1950. And that led to a quick series of further faithful decisions, including the analytical judgment that, and again I quote Nancy, despite the lack of any evidence of Chinese involvement, that the assumption that Peking had connived in the North Korean assault, end of quotation, and then the subsequent decision to come to South Korea's defense, the simultaneous abandonment of any hope of normalizing relations between the United States and China, the decision to interpose the Seventh Fleet in the Taiwan Strait, and finally the decision to escalate American war aims to include not just rolling back the North Korean attack, but also trying to liberate North Korea, what we would now call regime change by force. Now there's no doubt that this rapid series of analytic and policy decisions made in the space of less than one year between January and October 1950 established the general context for U.S.-China relations for the following two decades, a context of confrontation, hostility, and mistrust. Nancy's subsequent work on U.S. policy towards China dissected other calls. First, there was the decision in 1978 finally to normalize relations with China while de-recognizing Taiwan, the decision which was probably anticipated by Truman and Acheson earlier, but because of the Korean War had been indefinitely delayed. This decision, as I read Nancy's work, raised ethical considerations that gave her some pause, particularly treating Taiwan first, and here I quote Nancy, as an inconsequential irritant marring a grand design, close quote, and then as a, quote, relatively minor casualty of an important strategic accomplishment that would significantly enhance national security. So I think Nancy was a bit uncomfortable about how it was done and about the ethical considerations that seemed to her to have been given insufficient attention. Warren can probably tell you whether my reading of Nancy is right on this. Later, Nancy examined the decision to admit China into the WTO. This decision Nancy enthusiastically favored because it would not only be in the economic and strategic interests of the United States, she thought, but also would be in Taipei's interests as well, since China's membership in the WTO could be quickly followed by Taiwan's membership as a separate customs territory. In her later writing, Nancy focused increasingly on the tough analytical and policy calls that she saw being raised by the residual American security commitments to Taiwan. One article in the Washington Quarterly raised and answered a bluntly formulated question. If Taiwan chooses unification, should the United States care? And her emphasis was on the verb chooses, since she saw the possibility that as economic interdependence and societal interaction across the Taiwan Strait increased the prospect of Taiwanese uh, to choose unification, uh, sorry, the, the, as this happened, the prospect of Taiwanese to choose unification voluntarily might increase as well. Although that prospect seems more remote today than it did at the time, 
The question remains highly pertinent. And Nancy did not give it a simple answer. Instead, she suggested that Taiwan's uncoerced choice to unify with China would carry both benefits and costs for the United States. It would remove one of the biggest obstacles to a stable U.S.-China relationship, but it would also greatly enhance China's strategic flexibility, giving it the choice either to declare its irredentist claims satisfied and therefore to devote fewer resources to military preparations, or else give its remaining territorial claims higher priority and encourage it to develop an even greater ability to project naval and air power beyond its coastal waters, thereby threatening the sea lines of communication through the Taiwan Strait and the Western Pacific. In short, Nancy believed resolution of the Taiwan issue, even on Beijing's terms, would actually increase uncertainty rather than reduce it. As she summarized her answer, it would mean, and again I quote her, a less predictable, more flexible, and potentially less burdened opponent, although one still noted for its lack of transparency. Now, closely related to this analytic call, if Taiwan should choose unification, uh, would the United States, or should it, care? Closely related to this analytic call was a possible policy call being debated in 1998-99, when Nancy published an article in Survival entitled, China-Taiwan, U.S. Debates and Policy Choices. In that article, she analyzed the debates over whether the United States should modify its position regarding the security of Taiwan, then known, as many of you remember, as strategic ambiguity. Whether it should modify its position of strategic ambiguity in favor of a, one of several alternatives that she identified, from abandoning Taiwan altogether, to promoting dialogue or engaging in mediation between Taiwan and China, to the two opposite and more extreme options of guaranteeing Taiwan's security, on the one hand, or pressuring Taipei to come to terms with Beijing, on the other. Nancy gave in that article a characteristically sophisticated analysis of the likely pros and cons of each option, before concluding unequivocally, and I quote her, ambiguity is the only prudent policy. Since any alternative would reduce American flexibility while carrying greater costs and risks. And so from that clear standpoint, interestingly, uh, Nancy was highly critical whenever she saw signs of a shift of American policy during the George H.W. Bush and Clinton administrations, whether that involved closer ties to Taiwan, as with the sale of F-16s towards the end of the senior Bush's administration, or more distant relations with Taipei, as in reaction to some of the more admittedly provocative statements made by Taiwan's President Chen Shui-bian during the Clinton years. So these then were some, some of the analytic and policy calls that Nancy analyzed so thoughtfully in her research. So what are their equivalents in U.S. relations with China uh, today? Looking forward, some very specific and very difficult calls could very well be required in the foreseeable future. Many of them are obvious to you, particularly if China were to try to seize control of some of the disputed islands in the South China Sea or the East China Sea, or if North Korea started to implode, or if China began to use any of several forms of coercion to try to force Taiwan to the negotiating table. There might also be tough calls to be made in a variety of U.S. negotiations with China over a variety of issues, the terms of a bilateral investment treaty, the details of cybersecurity challenges, climate change. There are going to be many, many tough calls. Some we know are going to happen, others we fear might. But rather than focusing on these specific policy calls that we may have to face, I want to focus on two broader challenges, one analytic and the other a fundamentally important set of policy choices. In other words, I'm going to be looking at, in effect, today's equivalent of letting the dust settle versus uh, the, uh, or uh, the decision to draw the American defense perimeter uh, in Asia. Now, in identifying and discussing these toughest of tough calls, I may disappoint you because I will raise questions that I will not actually answer. 
But I will suggest some of the considerations that I think will be most useful, indeed most important, to those who will actually have to make those calls in the hope that this approach will be the next best thing to giving my own answers. My general theme will be that even the best theories of international politics will not be highly determinate to enough uh, to give clear or definite answers to the questions I will raise. That the future will therefore be highly contingent, that our analysis must therefore be probabilistic, and that our policy must remain flexible and responsive uh, to changing circumstances. And now as I think about it, that emphasis on flexibility is something that Nancy very clearly valued as she analyzed uh, some of the tough calls, uh, that uh, it would give China flexibility uh, if the Taiwan issue were resolved, that America needed flexibility in dealing with the new communist government on the mainland, that it wanted to make sure that China maintained its flexibility and didn't lean too far, too quickly towards the Soviet Union. So in emphasizing the need for flexibility, I'm also, in yet another way, uh, honoring uh, Nancy's uh, memory. Now all this is obvious advice, probabilistic analysis, flexible policy, responsive to changing circumstances. But it's advice that is not always taken or followed as consistently as it should be. So what's the first of these two calls I want to talk about? The big, tough analytic call which is basically assessing the prospects for China's policy toward and relations with its region, the Asia Pacific. Here the question is often posed in terms of starkly contrasting alternatives. Will China disrupt the balance in Asia, attempt to resolve disputes by force and seek a dominant role in the region, or will it engage in a peaceful rise, as Chinese leaders so often claim, seeking positive win-win relationships with all its neighbors? In reality, this call, this forecast of China's policy towards its neighboring region is a particularly tough call to make. In part, this is simply because the domestic and external factors that will shape China's policy are so numerous, their relative weight is so uncertain, and their direction is so unclear that they do not point in a definite, uh, indisputable conclusion. But an additional problem, one that makes it so difficult to make confident calls in so many areas, is that the theories of our, at our disposal, and by theories I simply mean our best supported assumptions about the most relevant statements of cause and effect, our theories of international relations in this case are so indeterminate. In what I regard as the, most, as the single most important book on political forecasting, Expert Political Judgment by Philip Tetlock, who now teaches at the University of Pennsylvania. The book warns against relying on only one theory in forecasting political phenomena, uh, or even then assuming that any one theory can generate clear and unconditional forecasts. He argues instead for the use of multiple theories and for probabilistic conclusions, for, as he puts it, for thinking like a um, fox rather than thinking like a hedgehog a distinction that he draws uh, from Isaiah Berlin. So let's take a closer look at the question at hand, how China's policy toward the Asia-Pacific region is evolving, and ask what theoretical insights can be brought to bear to answer it. What we quickly discover, as any of you who remember your introductory course on international relations theory in college will remember, what we quickly discover is that the field of international politics continues to be characterized by what are usually called contending approaches to analysis and forecasting. The cynical realist approach, which focuses on what it assumes will be the unfettered quest for power and security in an anarchic world. That leads to one set of forecasts. The more optimistic liberal approach, which focuses to a large extent on the role of international norms and institutions in regulating the behavior of states, or else on the stabilizing impact of economic interdependence on their relationships. And to these two has more recently been added a third set of approaches, usually called constructivist, which focus on the ways in which states, their governments, and their citizens perceive the international environment, and the ways in which their sense of national identity <coughs> shapes those perceptions. The constructivist approach is not inherently optimistic or pessimistic. 
It simply assumes that national perceptions, national values, national memories will differ and that they will matter. And that is an inherently indeterminate basis for forecasting. But what makes forecasts of China's international conduct so difficult then is not just that these different theoretical approaches often come up with different projections, but that each approach can generate different forecasts within the same model. Realist theory can uh, not easily predict how any individual country's power will evolve, whether it will attempt to balance power or balance threat in a given situation, whether it will choose to balance by aligning with others or by self-strengthening. All of these involve tough calls, but calls that will ultimately be made not by outside analysts trying to make forecasts, but by the decision makers in the countries in question. And again, realist theory does not finally predict exactly what's going to happen because of the possibilities that governments and analysts will perceive that balance of power in very different ways. Similarly, liberal theory correctly stresses the importance of economic interdependence, but the most sophisticated versions of that theory do not simply forecast, as the conventional wisdom goes, that uh, interdependence produces peace, but rather that much depends on the relative gains produced by that interdependence, whether the distribution of outcomes is regarded as just or unjust, whether the terms of investment and trade are regarded as fair or unfair, and whether the prospects for continued trade and investment are perceived to be good or poor. Other versions of liberal theory focus, as noted above, on international norms and institutions, but they do not necessarily predict how powerful these norms will be, how effectively they will be enforced, whether they will be vulnerable to erosion, or how effective international institutions will be in regulating the behavior of powerful national actors. So in short, theory may tell us very usefully what to look at, but different theories direct our attention to different aspects of the international situation, and they do not reliably predict what we will see at particular times and in particular circumstances. So even if we are informed by theory, as we must be, the resulting analytical calls remain tough ones, not easy ones. Our assessments must remain alert to the contingencies that will determine more specific outcomes and to the markers, the milestones, the turning points that indicate which contingencies are about to materialize and the factors that will shape the probability and impact of risks. Now the second call looking forward that I want to discuss is this, how to maintain a balance in Asia without triggering a downward spiral in the U.S.-China relationship. One common response to the uncertainties surrounding the forecasts of China's future behavior in the region, the uncertainties surrounding the implications of the rise of a new major power, as is happening in China with the rise of China today, uncertainties that I say are inevitable given the indeterminate conclusions that theory wisely applied uh, leads to. So one logical and very common answer is to form a counterweight against China. Not to stop it from rising, uh, but to constrain its behavior, to deter or prevent it from seeking a dominant position, or to encourage it to follow international norms and engage in cooperative international behavior. Despite China's reassurances that its rise will be peaceful and that its links with its neighbors will involve win-win relationships, the United States has reinvigorated its position in the region to hedge against the uncertainties still associated with China's rise. And this policy, whether known as the pivot or the rebalancing or re-engagement or whatever we call it, has been widely welcomed by other countries in the region. And this is understandable since, to repeat one more time, no theoretically well-informed forecast can rule out the possibility of a more assertive, even a more hegemonic China. But the problem is that policies that hedge against one risk can easily create or exacerbate another. Balancing strategies can very easily give rise to what has long been known as the security dilemma. Actions taken by one country or a group of countries in the hope of enhancing their own security 
can be seen by other countries as threatening and can lead uh, those other countries to reactive measures that in turn are seen as threatening by the first set of countries. So this dynamic can produce a pattern of action and reaction that can trace downward spirals of various kinds. Mutual mistrust, charge and countercharge, sanction and countersanction, and costly and risky arms races. Some believe that the United States and China are already beginning to experience such a security dilemma, although there seems to be a widespread reluctance officially to acknowledge that this might be the case. Instead, the focus on how it might be prevented um, on the assumption, uh, at least the hope, that it is not yet inevitable or irreversible. But the most commonly mentioned approaches to this problem do not appear to me to provide sure or effective solutions. And that's because, once again, the existing scholarship of which I'm aware provides useful insights but no definitive answers. The most common avenue taken to approach this problem has been the attempt to develop mechanisms that might reduce mutual mistrust, since mistrust can contribute to the security dilemma. Mistrust increases the chances that one side's actions, which it may genuinely believe to be defensive, will be perceived as threatening by the other side. But how can mistrust be overcome, or at least reduced, in that circumstance? One obvious answer is to offer reassurances of benign intentions. This is now commonly done in U.S.-China relations by both sides. The United States denies that it's trying to obstruct China's rise, welcomes its emergence as a, you insert adjectival string here, uh, peaceful, stable, prosperous, strong, secure, whatever, uh, well-governed, democratic. Again, the adjectival has uh, changed over time. But we welcome the rise of that kind of China. Um, and um, China insists that it seeks comprehensive cooperative partnerships uh, with both China, oh, sorry, with both the United States and its neighbors. Now, in themselves, of course, as we all know, words are cheap, and verbal reassurances alone are unlikely to be effective once mistrust has begun to emerge. Instead, the best research on the subject, that by Andrew Kidd, as his research concludes, it's necessary for each side to engage in what he calls costly reassurance, concrete unilateral actions that demonstrate benign intentions, don't just state them, and that compared with cheap talk are more persuasive precisely because they entail real costs. But in a situation of mistrust, such unilateral actions are understandably difficult to take especially when policy is being made not by a single wise individual, the philosopher king, but rather in a very complex political process, especially in a democracy, where unilateral concessions will be obviously criticized for being naive uh, and being therefore extremely, extremely risky, however desirable they may be in theory. And especially if they're not verified uh, and they are not reciprocated. A somewhat uh, different uh, but related and equally familiar answer is to engage in greater transparency, to reveal more about one's intentions and capabilities. We have tried that uh, with China. Uh, we talk about transparency as a key goal in our strategic and security uh, dialogues. And this certainly can help, but I think only if it involves the same spirit as Kidd's concept of costly reassurance. I would suggest that transparency also has to be costly. It has to provide information about intentions and plans, topics that each side would prefer to keep secret. And transparency about capabilities, whether strengths or weaknesses, that each side would prefer to keep veiled. In other words, I think what one needs is painful transparency uh, alongside costly reassurance. And again, you can see how difficult a call that is to make and especially to sustain against an inadequate response by the other party, uh, mistrustful and uh, inadequate response, and in the face of domestic and uh, perhaps uh, third party uh, criticism. A third frequently cited strategy is to avoid provocation, to avoid actions that could provoke 
a negative uh, response uh, and, on the other hand, to honor what the other side uh, declares to be uh, its, uh, its red lines. However uh, valuable this advice is in the abstract, and it certainly is a valuable one, its utility depends on how each side draws its red lines, especially if they overlap with each other. Uh, uh, rather than providing what I call a sufficient green zone between them where each side can pursue its interests without being seen as infringing on the interests of its counterpart. It's this problem of clarification of red lines depending on then how the red lines are drawn that is the most commonly cited concern about the Chinese call for a new kind of great power relationship because the essence of that proposal is that each side will accept and honor the core interests of the other without agreeing on what those core interests are or how those core interests will intersect and interact with, uh, uh, with each other. Uh, so without knowing what would be considered provocative by one party and how the second party would perceive accusations that it is engaging or thinking of engaging in provocative behavior, calls to avoid provocation are, as I say, good general advice but don't provide very much specificity to leaders who actually make the tough calls. A particular problem in the Asia-Pacific region is the fact that the system is multilateral and not simply bilateral and that many pairs of relationships are characterized by this kind of mistrust. And the headlines today, of course, are Japan's relations with Korea, Japan's relations with China. One could add China's relations with Vietnam. You could add a lot of mistrustful pairs. And given the fact that the United States and China have links to either or both of the members of these mistrustful pairs, one element of American strategy must therefore be to urge or insist upon restraint from its partners or even its allies to distance ourselves from provocative behavior when it occurs. This will not necessarily involve a single tough call, but a series of tough calls over time. A fourth possible answer to the security dilemma is to promote cooperation on issues where we and China have uh, common uh, interests. And one response to the Chinese call for a new kind of, of a great power relationship has been the response by the U.S. government that we should be focusing on common interests, not core interests. Well, that certainly sounds good and reasonable, but once again, it's far harder than it sounds. First of all, we have to ascertain where China and the United States actually perceive common interests, rather than simply asserting that they should exist. We have a tendency, I fear, to assert that China should have a common interest with the United States, whether or not they actually perceive it that way. Sometimes it even sounds like we're telling Beijing that we have a better understanding of their interests than they do. That is a very highly provocative and risky approach. It's not impossible to get others to redefine their interests. That's my operational definition of transformational leadership, in fact but we should not underestimate the difficulties. Whether in domestic situations or international ones, it is the most difficult kind of leadership. So beware of the temptation to lecture the Chinese on what their interests should be. What we have to understand is what they think their interests actually are and then try to work within that frame uh, to try to uh, find areas of cooperation and commonality while, of course, hoping over time that more subtle mechanisms can get them perhaps to rethink their interests, much in the same way as the Chinese are now saying quite explicitly the United States should rethink its interests uh, in the Asia-Pacific uh, uh, leadership. And even if we can identify common or overlapping interests, cooperation raises problems of its own. As with economic interdependence, there can be serious differences over relative gains. In other words, over the burdens that the parties bear in the course of cooperation and the way in which they share the benefits. The views of major stakeholders may make cooperation more controversial and therefore more problematic. And in situations of mutual mistrust that this strategy is trying to overcome, these problems may be especially uh, uh, severe. 
A final approach to the security dilemma is to engage in a process of cooperative security in which China and the United States negotiate compromises or quid pro quos that resolve or manage some of their security concerns, much as they have done or begun to do in the economic and commercial realms. Here the prerequisite is that both sides must be convinced that the prospective costs of the security dilemma are too great, that neither side can be confident of securing a permanent advantage, whether by outspending the other or by developing new coercive or defensive technologies that the other side cannot counter. Whether we are at that point yet requires a tough analytical call of its own that has to be made by both Beijing and by Washington. And even if we are, even if we agree that we are beginning to go down a very costly arms race or an escalation of tensions, the challenges of successful negotiation for all the reasons I've mentioned will be severe. So in short, what I've suggested this afternoon is that the kind of tough calls in U.S. policy towards China that Nancy Tucker has studied so insightfully are not things of the past. We will face more of them in the years ahead in terms of both analysis and policy and in terms of both strategy and tactics. In fact, I believe, I fear, I warn that the calls will get tougher over time. As the U.S.-China relationship grows more complex, as the balance of power between the two countries shifts, most likely in China's favor. This calls for a reinvigoration of a variety of American capabilities, and not just the continued forward deployment of military forces in Asia. It involves the need to uh, revitalize our and rebuild our economy, to restore our soft power, to improve our analytical capabilities, to develop our relations with a full range of actors and allies in Asia, and the growth of effective regional institutions. Above all, it will require the ability and then the determination uh, to make a continuing series of wise calls about each episode in our ongoing relationship with China. Thanks very much. <laughs> And Bob assures me that I can sit down and uh, take questions in a more relaxed way. He will um, moderate the discussion if that's needed, and he will watch the clock so we don't miss the reception to follow. Uh, Harry, you've given us so much to chew on. My guess is people are not going to be interested in either the liquid or the solid refreshments. They'll want to just keep going. Uh, but at some point, I will cut it off. My call, my <laughs> analytic call on that differs from yours. <laughs> uh, well, uh, Harry, that was not only as thoughtful and as nuanced as Warren and I had anticipated when we asked you to deliver this um, address. Uh, I, I was, I kept thinking again and again, Nancy would have really enjoyed this. She would have really appreciated it, both in her role as a scholar, but also in her role as a, a government official, and particularly maybe in her second job when she worked uh, in the office of the Director for National Intelligence. So um, our thanks to you. Um, I want to get the audience involved in this. Before I do so, however, there are two people in the audience I'd like to recognize. Um, the first one is Professor Shirley Lynn. Shirley, if you'll raise your hand. Uh, Shirley Lynn, for those of you who don't know her, is Harry's uh, better, wa better half, and uh, we're delighted. Uh, she came all the way from Hong Kong for this address. Uh, Shirley, we're delighted to have you here. Uh, the other person I want to not only recognize but also thank is my colleague Robert Daly. Robert, if you raise your hand. Um, Robert, as I expect all of you know, uh, directs our Kissinger Institute on China and the United States here at the Wilson Center. He's a relatively uh, new addition uh, and therefore a new colleague of mine.
but let me tell you, for those of you who haven't had the pleasure in meeting him, he's terrific. He's doing a terrific, uh, running a terrific program, and um, he was he and his program and his team were really an immense help in helping us uh, get the word out about this event today. So, Robert, uh, it's good to be working with you, and thanks a lot. Bob, if I could interrupt, uh, Bob has given a very interesting talk. He was kind enough to give me the talking points in which he raises and answers a Nancy Tucker-esque question. I'll paraphrase it slightly. If China should, should establish a dominant position in Asia, what's the worst that could happen? Again, a very interesting take on an analytic call. Well, Robert, we may uh, ask you to come up here the next time around <laughs> and deal with that. Um, okay, um, let's bring you into this discussion. We've got people on both sides of the auditorium. If you'll raise your hand, um, wait when I call on you until uh, we get a microphone to you and introduce yourself. Um, and please, uh, concisely, briefly, um, make a comment and or uh, state a question. So who'd like to go first? Let's go in the very back first. Thank you. I appreciate your presentation and all the talking points. It's very uh, provocative, very insightful. My name is Jin Ying Nguyen with voice of Vietnamese Americans. I came here from Vietnam at the end of the Vietnam War. And we are celebrating 35 years of the Taiwan Relations Act. I think all of that put a lot of background into your presentation. So coming back to the common interest of the US and China, I would like to also put in the common interest of Taiwan and Vietnam and the Asia Pacific, the East China Sea and the South China Sea. From your point of view, would you give us the vision of the interest of the US in that area and the interest of China in that area? And what would be the best scenario that Vietnam and Taiwan can also prosper? Thank you. Well, I think it's very clear to begin with uh, what China's interests are. Uh, China uh, claims uh, sovereignty over uh, all the land and water, the islands and water, that lie within this variously 9-dash or 11-dash or however many dash line. Uh, and on the basis of that, because in essence the law of the sea really depends in some ways on the law of the land. It's determined on the basis uh, of who owns what land from which various baselines uh, and uh, economic zones uh, and exclusive economic zones are, uh, uh, are drawn. Uh, China wants uh, it, and they're saying it's indisputable that China has sovereignty over water and land within that, within that space. Uh, then they have also um, their own interpretations of what are the implications of that in terms, for example, of the ability of various kinds of vessels, uh, especially military vessels and aircraft, to pass through uh, the zones that they declare, uh, as is most recently evidenced by the uh, air defense identification zone uh, that the Chinese established uh, unilaterally. So that's the Chinese interest. They have staked a claim. They are demanding that others recognize it. They are arguing that it is indisputable. In other words, they are denying the legitimacy of any claims that there are disputes. They're not, no longer acknowledging that there are disputes. They're saying that this is undisputed. Uh, and uh, they are now saying that uh, they are willing to use military force uh, to um, uh, assert those claims if they, if they so choose. What's the American interest? The American interest is basically very clearly stated. While not taking a position on these very, very complicated claims, uh, most of which are based on uh, very, very limited evidence, um, not taking a position on the legitimacy of the claims, what we are in effect saying is, first, very clearly saying, we oppose the use of force or coercion to try to settle those claims. 
Uh, we want this to be done according to international norms and laws, which unfortunately are vague on many of the points themselves. Uh, and uh, we want uh, this uh, to be done through a, uh, through, a peaceful, uh, through a peaceful process. So that's our position. You see where, therefore, the red lines basically do not give much space. That green zone, as I've called it, uh, is not very, very broad at this point because the Chinese are, seem to be backing away from any notion that they acknowledge uh, that these uh, territories are disputed and that they agree that claims should not be perceived, uh, pursued by, uh, by force. Uh, so that, and I have, again, I warned you, I'm not going to actually make the tough calls that I uh, say are on the horizon. Why? Because they are so complicated and so contextual. It's very easy for someone to sit, come to Washington from bucolic Charlottesville and say it's very clear that the call should be this, that, or the other. They are much more complicated. So I can't make a specific call on this except to say I think the broad American policy is, uh, makes sense to me and I think is right and I support. But how you apply that framework in specific cases, in specific circumstances, that's exactly the tough call uh, that I am talking about. And as I said earlier, this is not simply a bilateral U.S.-China call. It is potentially a call that involves our um, uh, relationships with both Philippines and uh, Vietnam and our alliance with Japan. All of these tough calls will be made in the context of those other relationships. That's why they're tough. Mm. Yes, Jim. Let us get a microphone to you, Jim. Thanks very much. Harry, thanks for this great presentation. Where um, does the uncertainty... Jim, you want to introduce yourself? I'm, I'm <laughs> Jim Mann, author. Um, where does the uncertainty over China's political future fit into your framework? Is that another uncertainty or... Are, or do you assume that China's relations with its neighbors and its interests will be the same no matter what happens to China domestically? And isn't that a realist position? It is. And what I tried, and for the sake of, um, for the sake of time, I actually struck out parts that said a little bit more uh, about that, including, I have to say, what your book on the China fantasy taught us about the difficulty in making these kinds of unconditional uh, forecasts about, about China's future, a book that I very much respect for identifying some of those not so um, insightful calls. Um, it certainly does, and as I said, even the realist analysis um, cannot really forecast all of the domestic or international factors and variables that will go into this. The most basic element of realist analysis is relative power. Relative power in a country like China is deeply affected uh, by uh, domestic circumstance. Specifically, is China going to continue to grow at a reasonably rapid pace, maybe slow down a bit? Is it going to basically have a very serious financial crisis, as some are worrying about, in which there would be a dramatic drop uh, in China's uh, rates of growth? Is it going to uh, have uh, basically a slowdown in the economy without collapse that would also be highly restricted, uh, restrictive, especially if it gives rise to domestic protests? So you can forecast lots of different outcomes, assign probabilities, but then forecasting the implications of that. There's a very, very uh, robust debate about whether a China that was beginning to experience severe uh, domestic upheaval, protest, whether that would make it more assertive and militant or more cooperative. I can make the case either way, and I can assert various international relations and uh, comparative foreign policy theories to support it. That's my point. This theory alerts us to the variables, but it does not in itself provide very confident forecasts. So I think that the future of China domestically is one of the sort of these layers of uncertainty, uncertainty compounded on top of uncertainty. That, we'll quote Yogi Berra again, makes prediction, especially about the future, very difficult. 
Uh, yes, in the middle. <coughs> I'm sorry for pointing, but the lights are right in your eyes, and you can't see people beyond about the third row. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Anastasia. Thank you very much for the talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I feel like one of the um, underlying requirements for the type of relationship we'd like to see is mutual understanding between the two players. And I was wondering if you could uh, talk a little bit to what you see as the major roadblocks between this mutual understanding. That's a very good question because it really does come down to the question of our ability to make sound analytic calls. Um, and I think that you could maybe answer this question in um, a couple of ways, whether the mutual understanding is really, are we talking simply about those um, sort of parts of the policy community broadly defined who are making analytic judgments, making assessments, or whether we are talking about a broader base uh, a societal base for, uh, for understanding. I think that I've already probably outlined uh, what my views are on that question of the sort of the professional analysis. The fact that these are horribly complicated situations where even within the same theoretical tradition or analytical tradition, you're very possibly going to come up with different, different uh, forecasts. And then if you go beyond that and look at competing theoretical traditions or theoretical assumptions, the range of forecasts becomes even wider. That's why, and if you uh, have not read this book, I really recommend it. Uh, and that is Philip Tetlock's uh, po uh, Expert Political Judgment, where he basically says that let's admit that we have such a range of uncertainty and a confusion, or he doesn't use that word, but and an abundance of theory that you really have to be probabilistic and contingent. You have to be able, as an analyst, to juggle various theories, use them eclectically, assign probabilities. And that's difficult to do. There are all kinds of pressures against doing that. Let me name two. One is that if you are, and uh, he has a wonderful and wonderfully funny analysis of what he calls hedgehogs, those who make absolutely certain, non-contingent, probability 100% forecasts. And he says, why do they have such a voice? And the answer is the media love them because they're not on the one hand this, on the other hand that. It could be this, it could be that. They come out with clear calls. Having worked on the periphery of Wall Street doing political risk assessment, I know clients want clear calls. And you make your name by making clear calls, even if from an objective and detached position, that is really not uh, justified by the <coughs> uncertainties involved. So that's one reason that um, uh, these uh, so many calls are absolutely non-conditional, that China will collapse, China will democratize, China will seek hegemony in the region. China will be forced to cooperate with the rest of the world on this issue or that issue. These kinds of clear calls are what get attention, as opposed to the, and we'll quote Harry Truman uh, uh, again, uh, his call, feudal, uh, feudal call uh, for a uh, one-handed economist, because he was always complaining, <laughs> but he was on the one hand this, on the other hand, uh, on the other hand that. So that's one. The other, and I think if people are here from the intelligence community, or even in my case, the private risk analysis community, the clients want clear calls. They don't like, as I said, uh, in quoting that wonderful part of uh, Nancy's analysis of the, uh, basically, the letting the dust settle decision, I'd forgotten that part of it, that policymakers would prefer not to have to make a decision in uh, periods of uncertainty. So what's the, if they have to make a decision, they turn to the analyst and you tell me, you tell me what's going to happen. You manage the uncertainty for me analytically. And that's what I faced in Wall Street all the time. They didn't want uh, conditional calls, maybe this, maybe that. Is this going to have an upward pressure on asset prices or not? Up or down, make a call. Well, it's 50-50. No, make a call. <laughs> and you can say, but you get the big bucks by making the call and putting it into action. I get the little bucks by giving you the sort of the structure of the situation. 
So analysts know that their reputation, their visibility, their notoriety is going to be made on the basis of making these clear but sometimes uh, too clear analytic calls uh, for which very few of them are ever called into account uh, if they're wrong. Uh, and the clients, whether in government or on Wall Street, want those clear calls. So I think that those are some of the huge problems on that side as to our ability uh, to do it. Another set of problems, which I won't get into, uh, especially if I get started, I'll never stop, is the way in which the academic community is becoming so much interested in pure theory that the analytic community is shrinking in terms of people who are interested in applying uh, insight and knowledge to uh, these kinds of issues. Area studies within several disciplines of the social sciences are being squeezed out and that's a uh, net loss to our uh, analytic, uh, uh, analytic community. In terms of society to society relations here, I think we're a lot better off because we're having growing numbers of people, many of whom are, or more importantly will be, uh, increasingly influential in their societies, having firsthand experience uh, with another culture. The United States asked Shirley about her experience teaching mainland Chinese students in Hong Kong they are learning a lot, not necessarily everything we would like them to learn or looking at it the same way we do, but indisputably, their understanding is being enhanced and being deepened. That's the good news. Mm. Mike, and then we'll go to you next. Mm -hmm. <coughs> other Mike, but that's all right, and I'll get the other Mike next. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Mike Ponte, I'm the director of the DPP's mission here in Washington. Thanks, Harry, for a great talk. Uh, one of Nancy's pets, of course, was Taiwan and the Taiwan issue. She's written endlessly about it and wonderfully. Taiwan, you've, we, we've seen it over the course of our careers, uh, has grown into a vibrant democracy. Too vibrant, some people think, but I don't think so. The Sunflower Movement that just kind of finalized its stay in the legislature shows this, uh, this democracy in, in all its glory, if you will. Uh, it raises problems, of course, for U.S. policymakers that you know well as well. So I wonder if you would reflect a little bit on that, because um, the United States likes peace and stability across the streets, and that's one of our prime goals, but democracy has a way of maybe irritating that a bit. I wonder if you'd spin that out a bit. Right. Well, I think, um, as I said, that this was, and as you said, Mike, this was one of the issues that really uh, preoccupied uh, Nancy. Uh, in the latter part of her, of her career. And as I said, what she really emphasized was the need for the United States to maintain, she was in the context of talking about strategic ambiguity, but I think the more basic concept for her was flexibility, to understand and, and, and her criticism of any administration that basically moved to what she saw as a excessive tilt, one side or the other, no matter what side that was. That was what was so fascinating of her analysis of the, uh, of the George H.W. Bush and Bill Clinton years. And she was equally critical, as I read her work, of decisions that seemed to be um, reducing American flexibility with regard to fulfilling a security commitment uh, to Taiwan. In other words, selling F-16s, implying a greater commitment than th she thought we should have, or backing away from Taiwan too much. She felt that some of the reaction to Chen Shui-bian's remarks was, uh, was excessive as I, uh, as I read her. Uh, so I think that that is a symptom of the broader problem that I mentioned, that these relationships we're talking about are multilateral that we will have friends and allies who, as we're seeing now in the case of Japan, do things or make statements uh, or um, have uh, various kinds of, uh, of actions or, or statements uh, that we think are, are, are provocative. Uh, and we have to maintain our ability to uh, back away or to distance ourselves uh, from those statements and actions, discourage them without um, giving uh, our partners the sense that their common values or their formal alliance gives them a blank check uh, because we will get trapped uh, in that if we're, not, if we're not careful. So that's how I would uh, respond to this. It's wonderful that Taiwan has, as you say, a vibrant uh, democracy. 
having spent uh, early years in Taiwan when it was not so democratic, I know what it was like then. It wasn't as bad as the mainland, uh, but it, it, was not, it was not great. And that process towards a vibrant democracy, not just in the legislature but in civil society, is a wonderful thing. But, as you said, sometimes democracies do things that even other democracies don't like. We have to be able to handle those. We've seen that with Japan. Japan is a democracy. It does things we don't like. It did it even before the recent developments in terms of uh, trade negotiations with the, with the United States. And that's why one of my least favorite simplistic theories, what I call cocktail party concepts, was the litany of uh, reasons for welcoming democracy that it was, it was common, especially as I remember in the Clinton administration. Uh, a great series of exaggerated claims that they would make better trading partners, they would not repress their own citizens probably right, uh, that they would uh, always be seeking peace with their neighbors, they'd never go to war. All of these exaggerated, non-contingent, non-probabilistic assertions about the benefits of democracy that I thought vastly overstated the case and uh, ran a very great risk of being falsified. So it's a good example that uh, democracy is wonderful, but we should not take the position that democracies will always do what we think is the right thing or things that we can support. I would have thought being here in Washington, none of us would have been tempted to assume that democracies <laughs> always did the right thing. <laughs> the other Mike, Mike Pillsbury. Hey, where is he? <laughs> Hi, thank you, Harry. Mike Pillsbury. I'm from an office that tries to be both a fox and a hedgehog. Uh, I wanted to dispute you on your version of Nancy versus other people's versions of Nancy on one specific contribution. Yes, she was fascinated by policy. She had many policy observations in her writings. I loved the piece with Bonnie Glazer on Taiwan. Uh, but it seems to me her real love was diplomatic history, especially American diplomatic history. And she enjoyed contrasting the uh, interviews policymakers give of how brilliant they were and how they saw everything and made the right choice and nothing went wrong with these documents she would find that had words like top secret eyes only on them or very, very hard to get which contradicted the oral interview or the policymaker's own account of what he or she had done. And it seemed to me Jim Mann, in some, some books, Jim Mann sort of matched her. So did Patrick Tyler. They uncovered these declassified documents. But it seems to me the real Nancy Tucker, and I used to quarrel with her about this, was an advocate of a Sherlock Holmes approach to declassified documents, many of which remain classified in terms of what actually the U.S. government has tried to do about China since 1949. I just ran across some, I was, I've now finished a book I'm considering dedicating to either Nancy Tucker or my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> On that one, I'll make a call. <laughs> but I was out at the Reagan Library, the Nixon Library, and the Carter Library. I found the number of Nancy's declassification requests, which were turned down. Hmm. One, is, one, she wrote four pages of materials for Doug Paul's NSC files. And she was given a very small percentage of what she asked for. So her quest remains to get straight what really has been happening lo these last five or six decades. So it seems to me where I'm disagreeing with you, if you portray Nancy in terms of a policy wonk, kind of like you and me and maybe two thirds of this room, aren't you missing her Sherlock Holmes effort to declassify the real story of what the US has been trying to do and then get insights and criticism from those nuggets? Right. Um, I can only agree with you, and if you're asking, you know, am I getting Nancy right, we're going to have to turn to the expert Warren Cohen about this. But, hey, historian. <laughs> right, historian. Um, but first of all, as I said, I am painfully aware that I only talked about one part of Nancy's work. Uh, 
uh, and there is the oral history and the more biographic parts of her work. And uh, that's something that I would like to take another look at. I don't have time to do all of it, so I completely agree with you on that. Um, I think the other question you're asking, however, is that since this is an ongoing process of getting deeper access to formerly classified information, getting access to uh, more interviews and oral histories, uh, is Nancy's history going to stand the test of time? As we all know, one reason that we have a rich corpus of revisionist history is that um, we get new evidence and we have to reassess our assessments. So, since I'm not a diplomatic historian, uh, whether Nancy's earliest work, say, on letting the dust settle, earliest also in the sense of the earliest call that she was analyzing, how today's diplomatic historians, U.S. diplomatic historians of that time would assess her work, I don't know. But my point was not to basically endorse her analysis of these decisions, but simply to direct your attention to this kind of question. What are the difficult, because she analyzed both of what I call it the two kinds of tough calls. The analytic calls, what's happening, what's going to happen, uh, the work that, that, that you do, Mike, and always have done, and then the policy calls, which sometimes we all do when we make recommendations uh, from outside government, and we make them when we have responsible leadership positions inside government. I just saw that, uh, and I had not, as I say, I reread it, uh, the work, and it just jumped out at me that she had this interest in looking at these calls that either had been made or that were being debated about basically should we move away from strategic ambiguity on Taiwan. And whether we agree or disagree with the call she would have made, maintain strategic ambiguity, or her analysis of how calls were made, I'm not in a position to judge that right now. All I'm saying is that this attention to analytic and policy decisions in situations of great complexity, great uncertainty, and again, ethical dilemmas was, I thought, a very impressive part of, uh, of Nancy's work. I think we're going to take two more questions. We'll go here first and then back there. Hi, okay. Uh, here is Chiang Zhu with Legal Daily China. Thanks very much for the excellent uh, lecture. I have actually one question with two parts. Just days back, the famous uh, scholar in Singapore, Mr. Chen Yongnian, wrote an article talking about U.S.-China relations. He has an argument in his, uh, in his article saying that the re he used the returning to Asia, as we know as a pivot to Asia or rebalancing, is the biggest strategic miscalculation by U.S. in the post-Cold uh, uh, War. So I just wonder, what's your comment on that? And how should the U.S. make this pol uh, policy as a consistent one? Secondly, he also made some recommendations there. While U.S. is uh, t undertaking rebalancing uh, policy in Asia, China also should rebalance the relations with the U.S. through two approaches. One is to avoid uh, an arms race with the U.S., in which China will lose. And I agree with that one. So my question is about the second one. He recommended that uh, China should expand the cooperation with the U.S. beyond East Asia, maybe. My question is that because China has so many worries behind, so how, should, how can China go further you know, to have uh, more cooperation with the U.S.? You also mentioned that uh, both countries should expand the common interests. So where are the common interests there, and how should the two sides to seek them? Thank you. Right. Two very good questions. Um, is the um, return to Asia the biggest strategic mistake? I don't think so. I think the biggest mistake, um, and unfortunately we seem to make it again and again, was the way we phrase these things. I can remember how controversial the phrase comprehensive engagement with China was. This was in the kind of the post, um, uh, the post Tiananmen era when we were trying to rebuild the relationship. And there the problem was one of translation into Chinese. What does the word engagement mean in English? Did it mean an agreement to get married? <laughs> right, engagement. Was it we were going to ding hun with China in a comprehensive way? Uh, did it mean a series of battles, military engagement? 
Uh, the idea of engagement in the sense of kind of meshing of gears or interaction is actually not the most common way in which engagement is used in most popular sp speech in the United States. So we picked a phrase which was very, very difficult to translate into Chinese and which caused enormous, uh, enormous confusion. Constructive strategic partnership, there was the other one, hugely controversial in Japan because the word strategic implied military, implied something having to do with security rather than the meaning of long-term and fundamental. And now we talk about the pivot. What are we pivoting away from in order to pivot to Asia? Rebalancing. We can talk until we're blue in the face about, well, we mean it in the same sense that we're rebalancing our investment portfolio. Again, that is a tertiary way in which the term is usually used. How can you just say, well, we're rebalancing, but that's not balance of power. What we really mean is kind of reinvigorating our engagement in Asia. Uh, and to say that that is not important for us to do is, A, to deny that we've been distracted for a variety of reasons over the last several years, and to deny that Asia is important. Of course we have to re-engage with Asia but we have chosen words that confuse as much as they clarify. So I don't think it's a strategic mistake. What would be the strategic mistake is if we do it wrong. And that's why I said that the real tough uh, policy call is how we re-engage to help maintain a stable situation in Asia, which does have elements of a balance uh, within the region without sparking the security dilemma. That leads to your second question. Uh, I'm glad to uh, hear that he recommends that China do everything he can, it can to avoid an arms race with the United States. <clears throat> I'm interested in the idea that this is an arms race that China will lose. What usually happens is that each side believes the arms race is one that it will win, <coughs> that either it can outspend the other or that it will develop, again, I'm thinking of uh, Mike Pillsbury's work on Chinese strategic doctrine, a sort of a magic weapon uh, or a set of weapons and tactics that can uh, fundamentally change the balance in its favor. That is the most dangerous kind of situation because each side is, and I said, what they, both sides have to agree is an arms race is a real danger and it will be unacceptably costly to both. Uh, and I'm not sure that we are at that point yet, but I'm uh, glad to hear that somebody uh, in, a, in Singapore, a distinguished scholar, is saying that. Expanding cooperation. I talked about that. Expanding cooperation implies two things. One, you can identify genuine common interests, and then you can develop means of cooperation uh, that are seen as representing an equitable uh, sharing of burden, cost, and of benefits. And you already identified the problem, that China claims it is, has too much on its plate to cooperate with the United States. Too busy, too many internal problems. We really can't afford to do it. So sorry, call us in a couple of years when we've straightened everything out domestically. I'm being a little sarcastic to make a point. Uh, but I think that the problem is that to call for cooperation is one thing. It's like calling for transparency and uh, uh, confidence-building measures. But you very quickly get into these two next questions. Can we agree on what the common interests are? And can we agree on what we're going to do in ways that are seen as uh, adequate burden sharing? I know, as many of you do, that there is an increasing tendency to criticize China uh, for basically not pulling its weight, for punching below its weight, uh, because of its reluctance to take on these kinds of responsibilities. I can see why Chinese leaders would say what they say, and I have no doubt that they feel they have real constraints. But at the same time, they have to understand why we say what we say about their seeming reluctance to engage in as much as they could do, which is not everything at any cost. But there is a sense, most recently I saw an article arguing that China is not cooperating as much as it could or should on the North Korean question. So that's why cooperation is great to call for, but don't kid ourselves about whether it will be easy. It will involve a series of ongoing tough calls, analytically and policy, to move from a vague notion, let's cooperate, to really effective cooperation that begins to reduce mistrust
build mutual confidence, and stabilize the relationship. One last question. Um, it seems, uh, again, like the others, I appreciated very much uh, your presentation. Uh, my name is Michael Yehuda. I'm now from GW. Um, it seems to me, though, that what China has been claiming in the last few years is not something which they say is indisputable, but they're seeking to change the rules of the game in the sense that they are saying that international law was something that was set up before they came on the scene, as it were, and they have historical rights, however dubious we may think that the history is. But in itself, it seems to be a, uh, far from being an inactive approach to the world, a highly active and challenging one in which it's changing, if you like, the nature of the call itself. And it, potentially it has very profound uh, policy implications as well because uh, uh, members of the administration have more or less denied the basis for, for China's claim by saying they don't recognize the dashed lines. So I wonder, given the perspective you've been giving us, how you would, uh, first of all, analyze this and what do you think uh, might be uh, what various ways of handling it from a policy perspective? Yeah. Thanks, Michael. Um, I think that I've already said everything that I can say about the dashed line, about the territorial claim itself. But I think uh, what I do want to talk about is the very important points you're making about norms and challenges to norms. As I said, one of the um, articles of faith of liberal international relations theory is that norms matter. Laws, international laws, international norms, international institutions can be a powerful constraining force that gives us more hope uh, than the realist theory would, uh, would suggest. That's why I said it's more optimistic. But as I said, it really does depend on the vitality of those norms. And I didn't say much more than that. I said something about the vitality uh, and how they're enforced. So let me just say a few words elaborating on that, because I think that's what you're getting to. Uh, first of all, we do have the convenient assumption, um, what, uh, what Jim might call, Jim Ann might call another fantasy, that there is this international community that has a consensus on these norms. Uh, and what we are seeing is that a lot of these norms are being challenged. Uh, they're being challenged by Russia. Uh, most visibly, they are being questioned by China. Um, and it partly is that uh, they have a different set historically of norms and expectations rooted in national identity, which is related to all of this. Uh, and above all, as you say, they are, they say these are not norms that we wrote. This is basically the equivalent of taxation without representation. We weren't represented. We're not represented now in the formation of a new multilateral institution, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So when you have that challenge, that raises questions about the legitimacy of the norms. And then if the norms are not upheld, then they erode even further if they're not enforced. And by upheld, I mean enforced. So I think we have a real problem here that uh, we are seeing challenges to norms openly by Russia, a little still more subtly by, uh, by China, but basically uh, many years ago in a, in a talk at the um, at Carnegie Council uh, on uh, ethics, uh, for ethics in international affairs, if I can get the prepositions right, for ethics in international affairs, uh, in New York, I said that there is really not, there may be a community in the broad sense, but that community increasingly is made up of two different political parties. Uh, one is the conservative party, uh, which is basically the party that I called of the Westphalian order, uh, and there is then the uh, post-Westphalian modern political party, which is proposing a very different set of norms. What I suggested at that point was it was the United States and its allies that were the radicals. They were the ones who were proposing the new norms. What you're suggesting now is that China is also challenging some of these norms. But this is part of the dynamic, um, that norms get challenged. And if they are not, if they're challenged, that's one step towards erosion. If they're not enforced, and countries can feel that the other norms are beginning to rise to supplant them or provide an alternative, uh, that is what I fear is happening. 
So I think you've put your finger on a very important subject, which led, leads me to have very serious questions about the efficacy uh, of many of the liberal approaches. I, I have doubts about all of these theoretical, <laughs> frankly, uh, because I think they all have insight. They're all important. I'm not one who believes that theory tells us nothing about international affairs, which is some, I think, unfortunate, uh, unfortunately, some very experienced practitioners say. If you are making a forecast, you are applying a theory. Like it or not, you are. The only question is whether that is a robust theory that, or as opposed to what I call a cocktail party concept, uh, and whether that robust theory is being intelligently applied. But don't say you're atheoretical. It's just that if you say you're atheoretical, that means you're not aware of the theory you're applying. <laughs> and therefore, it probably isn't a very good one, or you're probably not applying it very, uh, very well. All of these theories have insights. But as I said, they tell us what to look at. They don't forecast what we're going to see. And that's a very, very fundamental distinction. Well, I think I will call it to a conclusion here, though. Harry, had you and I bet as we talked about earlier, about whether people would have wanted to continue to go on, I probably would have won that bet. The good news, however, is we can go next door and continue to go on. Um, I want to conclude with really where Harry started, um, him quoting Jim Webb on the definition of leadership, which is uh, the ability to make a continuing series of tough calls or difficult decisions. Um, uh, Harry, you have certainly underscored for us today what a valuable commodity uh, leadership is and perhaps challenged us to uh, reassess uh, our expectation that we will continually have uh, good leadership across the board. Uh, in some ways, you've discouraged us a little, but in a different set of ways, uh, I think you've really caused us to um, um, have a new set of perhaps more realistic expectations. Um, we thank you. Uh, this has been just what uh, Warren and I had hoped for. Um, Warren, again, we thank you for um, your sponsorship of this series and your continuing support of the Wilson Center as well as of this series. I want to invite everybody now, um, as you go out the back door, Turn to the right and walk straight. Uh, there should be refreshments for us uh, in the other room over there where we can continue this conversation. Now join me, if you will, in thanking Harry Harding. Terrific, Harry. Thank you, Warren.